Well, hello and welcome to another episode of In Conversation with Benedict Rogers, uh, an interview series produced by Hong Kong Watch. And it's a really great uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome as our guest this week, uh, Peter Ricketts, Lord, Lord Ricketts. Uh, Lord Ricketts um, served with distinction in some of the most senior positions in British foreign policy, uh, permanent secretary of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the chair of the Joint in, uh, Intelligence Committee, uh, and as uh, the Prime Minister's first national security advisor under uh, David Cameron's uh, premiership, um, as well as permanent representative to NATO and um, ambassador to France. But uh, the real reason you're joining us for this uh, interview is your uh, uh, two positions uh, on Hong Kong. Um, firstly, uh, as part of the negotiating team for the joint declaration from 1982 to 84, uh, and then in the early 90s as head of the Hong Kong department in the run-up to the handover uh, at the uh, Hong Kong department at the Foreign Office. Lord Ricketts, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, Ben. We're talking just a few days after the 25th anniversary of the handover <laughs> of Hong Kong. Um, looking back to the handover in 1997 and your time in the run-up to it, what were the hopes and expectations at that time? Well, my hope was not that we would succeed in maintaining Hong Kong's way of life untouched for 50 years. I think that was always too much to hope for, but that there would be enough of Hong Kong's distinctiveness remaining and that the Chinese would see that as in their interests to maintain a strong, successful Hong Kong within the framework of the Joint Declaration for us to be able to preserve the essentials, um, the essentials of the rule of law, uh, the economic structure, and perhaps even some gradual evolution on the political structure. Um, and I thought that that would have both obviously been in Hong Kong's interest, but also have fitted in with the interests of the mainland, which at that time were very much about integrating China into the international economic system of increasing their economic cooperation with the West. And I thought and hoped that they would see Hong Kong as a bridge to that. You worked very closely with Chris <clears throat> Parkman uh, when he was governor, and he's just published uh, his diaries from his time as governor, the, the Hong Kong diaries. One of the things that comes through the diaries is not only the challenges uh, that were faced with uh, negotiating with the Chinese side, but also his disagreements with some uh, in uh, both the Foreign Office and, and the political establishment in, in London. Could you comment a bit on, on that? Yes, I mean, I was actually the first person to receive Chris Patton when he had um, been announced as the new governor and he came across to the Foreign Office to start his briefing more or less on the same afternoon and I met him on the steps of the Foreign Office. And the very first thing he said to me uh, was Peter, I am not going to wear that hat. In other words, he was not going to be a traditional colonial governor wearing diplomatic uniform, carrying that rather ridiculous hat with the feathers uh, in it that uh, people will have seen pictures of. And actually that was a um, foretaste of uh, the way Chris would handle the governorship, which was going to be very different to anyone who'd had it before. All previous governors had been diplomats, officials, um, who were in the tradition of uh, civil service governors. Chris Patton was not only a politician, he was the closest personal and political friend of the prime minister, John Major, and very close to the foreign secretary, Douglas Hurd. So this was someone who was bringing to the governorship a whole different uh, range and level of contacts in London. And he approached the governorship in a very different spirit. Uh, another example of that, we provided for him his arrival speech in Hong Kong in rather traditional uh, governor terms, cautious, um, um, uh, suitably um, general about future aspirations, uh, couched in diplomatic speak. And the speech he gave actually was um, a rousing, um, exciting political declaration talking about Hong Kong uh, as a shining city on the hill. So we knew we were into a different kind of governorship 
And some of the traditionalists found that difficult. Um, so Percy Craddock, to use his name early in our interview, um, was someone who um, didn't appreciate the eruption of um, a very political approach to the governorship of Hong Kong, worried what that would do um, in terms of the Chinese reaction and the stability of Hong Kong. And so from the very start, it was clear that uh, the Patton governorship was going to be a more difficult um, passage for um, the civil service, for those who'd been accustomed to a different approach by the governor, and quite a lot of adjustment was going to have to happen in the foreign office, in the Hong Kong government structures, and particularly among the foreign office officials who'd made that career handling Hong Kong under a very different kind of governance. Mm, absolutely. Um, you, um, uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, before taking on the uh, role as head of the Hong Kong department, you had been part of the negotiations for the joint declaration. Today, um, uh, halfway through the 50 year period uh, of uh, one country, two systems, China has basically broken all its promises. The previous foreign secretary, Dominic Raab, described China as being in a state of ongoing non-compliance. Uh, Liz Truss has uh, similarly said China is in breach of the joint declaration. What are your reflections on uh, the situation today and, and what, if anything, can be done uh, to, ho to, to hold China to account for breaching the treaty that you helped negotiate? I mean, they manifestly are in a gross breach of the undertakings in the joint declaration. Uh, and it's just worth remembering a little bit that period. I uh, was made a junior private secretary to Geoffrey Howe in 1982, in the middle of the enormously intensive and detailed and exacting negotiations that David Wilson was carrying out for the government under the general overview of Percy Craddock. Uh, and they produced an extremely detailed text, um, pinning down exactly what Hong Kong's way of life meant and the freedoms uh, that would be preserved for 50 years. And the Chinese adopted that as their own text. And actually the joint declaration is essentially British confirmation of a Chinese text in which they undertake to preserve these freedoms after 1997. And that reflected Deng Xiaoping's approach, uh, which was very much um, priority to economic development and therefore to cooperation with the West and the approach of Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin uh, succeeding him each over their 10 year period, who were also willing to work with the West and to cooperate. And in that context, although Hong Kong's freedoms were encroached upon, um, the essentials, particularly the economic um, freedoms were preserved. What changed was the arrival of Xi Jinping, uh, who took a much more confrontational and aggressive approach to relations with the West from the very word go. And I think as part of that, it became intolerable to the new Chinese communist leadership to see this haven of capitalist freedom and individuality um, um, blossoming in Hong Kong. And so the systematic crackdown on the rights and freedoms of Hong Kong, the uh, intolerance of the sort of uh, liberal um, political arrangements, social arrangements, uh, economic structures that, that uh, the Joint Declaration had set out. So the problem is not with the Joint Declaration, the problem is with the Chinese Communist Party's attitude to it and willingness to ride roughshod over it um, uh, with no respect for the fact that it is an international agreement lodged at the United Nations. And now that is a very, very fundamental change in the circumstances, which honestly I think was not foreseeable in 1984 when Mrs. Thatcher signed the Joint Declaration uh, or indeed in 1997. Uh, I think it was a reasonable hope at that point that the Chinese party would want to continue to cooperate with the West in the interest of a stronger and more prosperous China. That has changed and Hong Kong has been a victim of that. And what can we do about it? Well, uh, in the immediate term, not very much because um, clearly uh, China has now um, gripped every aspect of life in Hong Kong. Britain is in no position to do anything uh, in practical terms to contest that. 
in legal and political terms, we must continue to contest the fact that China is ignoring its uh, legal undertakings. It's in violation of international law, to put it in those terms, and we should be seeking to extract a price for that in, among the many other countries who shared our hope that um, the joint declaration and the basic law would be respected um, and are equally horrified by what they see going on in Hong Kong. So if China ever wants a, uh, a full acceptance of its uh, role as a law-abiding member of the international community, then it ought to be um, rowing back on the um, uh, um, draconian changes it's made in Hong Kong's way of life over the last two or three years. I can't say I think that's very likely, but I think that should define, in part, the West's attitude to China and its willingness to stand by its word. With hindsight, and it's always easy to ask questions with, with hindsight, but with hindsight, um, do you think uh, there should have been some kind of enforcement mechanism built into the joint declaration uh, to prepare for the possibility of it being violated? I don't know what such an enforcement mechanism would have been. I mean, remember that the joint declaration was a reaction to the hard fact that 98% of um, Hong Kong territory, including all of Kowloon, was going to revert to China, whatever happened at the expiry of the 100-year treaties in 1997. So um, the joint declaration was uh, negotiated against the deadline because uh, the UK side accepted, even Margaret Thatcher, after a lot of um, soul searching, accepted that there was no alternative. The idea that there could perhaps be British administration um, with some kind of uh, acceptance by the Chinese that they would have nominal sovereignty, but Britain would continue to administer the territory, that never worked. And once we'd accepted the principle of Chinese sovereignty and administration, I think we gave up the opportunity for uh, any kind of enforcement action. I mean, the, the only um, sanction for a country that breaches international law really uh, is the loss of reputation and the fact that countries will then look at China in a different way and look at agreements made with China in a different way, knowing that the most formal and binding kind of agreement that China reached with the UK over Hong Kong was flagrantly violated 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Ben, I, I don't know that there was any provision that we could have written into the joint declaration that could have anticipated and preempted what happened when Xi Jinping decided to overrule his international law obligations. Mm. You, you mentioned the word uh, sanction. Um, and in your book, uh, Hard Choices, which, uh, which I'm currently uh, reading, um, having fi finished uh, Chris Patton's The Hong Kong Diaries, um, you make the observation, um, which was true at the time you wrote the book, and it's, it remains true today, that Britain has, uh, has not and indeed seems reluctant to impose any kind of targeted economic sanctions, even though the United States has done so, and, and, and Britain has done so in uh, response to the situation in Xinjiang, but, but not in response to uh, the breaches of the agreement for Hong Kong. Do you think, mm. um, well, but maybe you could say a bit about why you think that is and whether you you agree with that position or whether you think some targeted sanctions could be imposed. Well, I think what we're looking at here is realpolitik in action, because at least up until recently, um, the view in London was that we needed China's market. We needed um, to have access to the most dynamic um, economic marketplace in the world at that time. Uh, this was before the zero COVID policy in China, which has much dampened Chinese economic growth. But at the time, it was seen that uh, as you know, the fastest growing large economy in the world, uh, at a time when Britain had left the EU, had lost several percentage points of GDP per year by being excluded from the EU with all the additional trade barriers, that we didn't have any choice about continuing access to China's market, um, although showing greater caution about being too dependent on sourcing um, uh, high technology, security relevant um, equipment from China. 
Uh, and therefore, I think uh, the British government's calculation at the time uh, that the crackdown in Hong Kong happened was um, to take a very stern line in terms of political rhetoric, which they did to their credit, but not to uh, get into the issue of economic sanctions, um, partly because sanctions imposed by the UK on China would have been uh, you know, barely noticeable in China, um, given the difference of scale. And I think because Britain feared reciprocal, reciprocal um, measures from China, which could have hurt Britain quite badly. They were probably looking at the example of Australia, where um, uh, Australian uh, criticism uh, of China has uh, resulted in some pretty fierce Chinese sanctions on uh, exports from Australia. And I guess Britain wanted to avoid the same in the years after Brexit. I think the revelations about what was happening in Xinjiang and the fact that other countries were reacting to that, including America, perhaps gave Britain more courage to take some economic sanctions or particularly sanctions against individuals um, in that case. Um, but I'm afraid we're looking at real politique that there was a political judgment, I guess, that balancing up the importance of the Chinese market, the fact that individual economic sanctions by the UK would have made no difference at all in China, might have risked a retaliatory response, meant that they didn't reach for the economic lever. Uh, and in my view, that was probably wrong, yes. I think it would have been a, a more powerful statement and perhaps attracted more um, support from other democratic countries if Britain had acted at that point to sanction particularly the individuals who were involved in the crackdown um, under the so-called Magnitsky laws for those who are uh, flagrant breaches of uh, human rights. And I mean, not necessarily comprehensive economic sanctions, but targeted sanctions on those responsible as we later did in Xinjiang. I think that was a missed opportunity. That's, that's very interesting. Just um, staying with the economic relationship uh, with China, um, <clears throat> You say in, in your, your book, which I have here, uh, Hard Choices, um, that Thank the, you. <laughs> the uh, and I would recommend it to our, to our viewers and listeners, um, you say that the, uh, the trend towards closer engagement uh, between China and the West, which was underway uh, in the, since the 1980s, uh, has now been decisively reversed. Um, the central question you write, uh, which has far-reaching implications for British foreign policy, is how far the decoupling will go, um, and, and particularly given the mistrust between the United States and, and China. Um, how far do you think decoupling uh, will, decoupling or perhaps to use a different word, um, uh, diversification of, of economic relationships um, will go? Well, I think diversification is already underway, uh, or others have called it reverse globalization, um, or re-onshoring of some of the critical manufacturing capabilities and supply chains so that we no longer find ourselves uh, dependent um, as we did on, for example, Huawei equipment for our 5G mobile phone networks, uh, something which we were planning to use at least in part of our system until the Americans said that that was out of the question. And we found that there were, you know, there, were there was no American supplier of similar equipment and only two rather small European suppliers. So the West was caught out on uh, 5G uh, technology, and it's vital that the West isn't caught out in the future on um, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, high technology of the future. Uh, we need to have sovereign capability there. But I do worry about a world where the American economic sphere and the Chinese economic sphere are completely separated, where American sanctions have effectively meant that China um, reduces its exports, reduces its economic involvement, and um, reduces the financial uh, interconnection between the two worlds, where there is a Chinese internet and an American internet, um, Chinese-led um, data rules, American-led, uh, and effectively you either trade and work with the American world or the Chinese world. I mean, in that case, of course, Britain will work with the American dominated world. But it does remain the case that most of the economic dynamism of the next century is going to come in Asia and is likely to come in the area dominated by China. And I would hope, as a sort of liberal internationalist, that it would be possible to preserve some degree of cooperation with China, 
in the non-sensitive areas of trade, um, partly because that's the most efficient way for countries to, to trade, but also because we can't um, operate global governance without the Chinese, whether it's in trade policy or climate change policy or energy policy, many, many other areas, we can't reach global agreements without China. And the pandemic has shown us, if nothing else, that global health policy um, is extremely uh, disrupted if there isn't global cooperation on emerging public health problems. So I am uh, nervous about the idea that we try and wall ourselves off completely from China um, because of Chinese human rights abuses and undoubted uh, breaches of international law. I think we still need to maintain links with China. And I'm not, I don't give up hope that in the post Xi Jinping era, you know, others will think again about the wisdom for China of uh, autarky, of being completely separated from the, from the uh, uh, democratic world, uh, the liberal open trading system, um, and perhaps uh, the zero COVID policy and some of their very aggressive uh, moves in international relations may be convincing younger leaders rising in the Chinese system that that wasn't the right path. China has swung dramatically um, from one extreme to the other in the past. And I wouldn't exclude a swing away from Xi Jinping thinking uh, and all its consequences. So I don't want to burn my boats with China completely uh, while recognizing that um, some um, disconnecting, decoupling uh, in some areas is happening and is probably essential. A penultimate question. We, we've spoken just a few moments ago about uh, the limited options for, for Britain, Britain's failure to, to use sanctions. The one thing uh, the United Kingdom has done uh, in response to the situation in Hong Kong is the very generous uh, British National Overseas BNO uh, scheme that opens up a pathway for um, several million Hong Kongers to come to the UK. And of course, uh, further to that, it, it extended it to apply to vulnerable young people um, uh, uh, to, to come here independently of their parents. Uh, what are your reflections on, on that, uh, on both the what it means for Hong Kongers, um, uh, the opportunities, but also the challenges of welcome and integration uh, into the, the UK? Um, and were you surprised that the, the, the government acted as it did? Yes, I was pleasantly surprised that the government acted so strongly um, and clearly and opened this scheme you know, with no caveats, really, uh, very much an open door policy. Of course, it's enormously in Britain's interests to benefit from the tremendous talents of people coming from Hong Kong. I've worked with Hong Kongers you know, long enough to know, you know what wonderful people they are, how hardworking, how creative, um, how stimulating. I don't have any concerns about the integration of people arriving from Hong Kong into the UK. I think it can only be a benefit to the UK. What I worry about is the impact in Hong Kong of uh, the brain drain, the talent drain um, of many of the most, um, uh, the brightest and the best and the, uh, the best educated uh, leaving Hong Kong, coming to the UK and other places, enriching our societies but leaving behind in Hong Kong what? I mean, um, many of the talents that Hong Kong um, should have been benefiting from for the future won't be there. So I think it's, I think it's good news for the UK. I think it's a, it's a bold and generous gesture by the British government, which I welcome. But its implications for Hong Kong to me are very worrying because uh, it will mean that um, most of those who had confidence in the kind of Hong Kong we were trying to build after 1997 won't be there anymore. Um, and it, it seals Hong Kong's fate even more surely, I suppose, you know, as a more and more Chinese city uh, and territory dominated by the Chinese National Security Police. And I mean, that is a rather depressing outlook for Hong Kong. But I think the, the movement of so many talented people to the UK can only be a good thing for the UK. And I hope individually for all those who come here will find it an enriching experience. Absolutely. I, I sometimes, um joke, and of course it's it's very tragic circumstances, but I, I sometimes joke that um, because I was 
denied, as you may, may know, denied entry to Hong Kong back in 2017. I, I sometimes joke that now I can no longer go to Hong Kong, but <laughs> Hong Kong is coming to me, um, which is, uh, uh, mm. you know, wonderful in, in the circumstances. Just the other day, um, I, in fact, just yesterday, I, I went to my local opticians to collect my new glasses. And uh, the optic optician was a Hong Konger who, when I gave my name, she said, oh, I, you're from Hong Kong Watch. And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, there can you I, are. She said, can I take a selfie? She was supposed to be fitting my glasses and, <laughs> and took us. There, there you so go. There you go. There you go. No, no, there's, a, there's already a very tight Hong Kong community here, of course. <laughs> it's going to get much bigger and it'll be very vibrant and dynamic and we'll have absolutely no problem in integrating. It will be to the benefit of all of us. But it's terribly sad for Hong Kong to be losing all these talented people. Exactly. Well, one final question. Um, what message would you want to give to people watching this, uh, Hong Kongers, friends of Hong Kong, uh, about the future and about um, you know, any possibility of, uh, of hope for uh, a better future for Hong Kong at some point? Well, I think my message has to be don't lose hope. Um, I still think that the dream of the joint declaration um, was uh, was justified and may still in the long view of history turn out to be right. Uh, I, I really do believe that over time, increasing prosperity uh, will encourage people in China to want greater choice and to see that the West offers a way of life which is better than that in communist dominated China. Uh, and the fact that so many millions and millions of Chinese people traveled before the zero COVID policy snuffed that out, uh, means they must have come back with a sense that there was a more vibrant, uh, interesting, lively world out there. Hong Kong, of course, was a window on that world. And so as China becomes uh, more prosperous over the decades, um, Xi Jinping won't be there forever. Uh, I think the demand for choice, the demand for more freedom of expression, um, the demand to use growing prosperity for people to, to exercise a bit more individual choice will chip away at the uh, very harsh, extreme kind of communist domination which Xi Jinping thinking seems to require. And in that context, there will be a new future for Hong Kong and other great Chinese cities in due course. So don't give up hope, I think, and don't lose hope in the fundamental importance of freedom and freedom of choice, freedom of speech, which we treasure here and which Hong Kong has sadly lost, at least for the moment. Well, that's a, a very um, positive note on which to end. There's so many uh, other questions I could ask, and it's been fascinating talking to someone who was at the heart of negotiations for the Joint Declaration and then leading the Foreign Office's uh, uh, work on Hong Kong in the period up to the, the handover. Um, but we are uh, out of time. So, Lord Ricketts, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, and, and uh, very good luck for Hong Kong Watch for all the great work that you do. Thank you very much.